Good morning. Welcome to our session on funding with our dear friends um, and colleagues from the federal and provincial governments. Um, Ontario, the provincial government from our friends from across Canada um, who are joining us this morning. My name is Debbie Douglas and I'm the executive director of OCASI. I will be your moderator this morning. Um, this is always a popular session and especially more so now um, as we live through this new normal, um, as we work our way through this pandemic. Um, it is a great pleasure uh, to have with us this morning uh, Laura De Paolo, Director General of the Settlement Network of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Jomen Shazu Isindi, um, who is the Acting Director for the National Division of the Department of Women and Gender. And Yvonne Farah, who is the Director of Programs in the Citizenship and Immigration Division and the Office of Women's Issues at the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services here in Ontario. This morning, we have regrets from our colleague from Canadian Heritage who is unwell, so we are sending her healing energy. I know that many of you who have joined us have lots of questions. What we will do is have our guests present for about 10 to 12 minutes each in the order in which they were introduced, and then we will open up for questions. Participants, you will see that there's a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Please use that box to write your questions. And when we get to the Q&A session, I will be reading from that. We look forward to having a wonderful day. It is great to be joining you from Toronto, the territories of the Mississaugas of the credit. So without any further ado, we will begin. Laura, welcome. Great, thanks very much, Debbie. Can you hear me all right? Good, excellent. Um, so thanks you very much. It's really great to be here with you today. Uh, I think it's a real testament to the resilience of uh, the organization and your members uh, to see how many of you are able to join in um, and that you've been able to adapt this conference to this online format. So thank you very much and, and kudos to your team. And thank you very much for the invitation to participate on the panel. We're really pleased to be here today. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that uh, the land on which um, we gather for those of us in the Ottawa region is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation. I recognize that there are different territorial lands where others are joining from and I would encourage everyone to do your own research to find out which territory you reside on and to explore how you can honor Indigenous people in your own way. Je vous remercie d'avoir inclus IRCC dans vos discussions aujourd'hui. Il est difficile de croire que nous sommes au beau milieu d'une pandémie depuis huit mois maintenant. L'automne est souvent le moment où nous reprenons nos activités normales après l'été, que ce soit le retour à l'école, au travail, au sport d'équipe ou à l'engagement communautaire. Mais cette année, mais cette année continue de ne ressembler aucune aucune autre année. So, oops, thank you very much for, um, for including us in your session today. It's really hard to believe that we've been in this pandemic situation for eight months now. The fall is often the time when we get back to our normal routines after the summer, when uh, it's back to school, uh, back to work, or our regular sport teams and our community involvement. But this year continues to be uh, a year like any of, unlike any other. We're now experiencing the second wave of COVID um, and much time and effort has gone into ensuring appropriate safety measures are in place for our staff. And we know that it's the case as well for your staff and clients. The department will continue to focus uh, and follow federal and local public health advice regarding safety measures and the return to in-person services. We have been working on a plan that would allow our officers to begin to resume some face-to-face -face activities with your organizations on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but we're currently in the pilot stage and so there'll be more to come on that um, later on uh, this fall. Our biggest priority right now is to continue providing uh, as much support to you all in the continuation of delivering programs and services while minimizing risks to all staff and clients during the pandemic. The closest uh, to the resettlement world uh, are seeing refugees at their most vulnerable from the initial meeting uh, through their resettlement and integration experience. 
The world has changed a lot with the advent of COVID, not just for us, but especially for the most vulnerable. And we recognize the importance of making sure that as we resume our arrivals of refugees, that we are carefully assessing the capacity on the ground to serve these, uh, the needs of, of all, all the refugees arriving. The need to quarantine has created greater challenges on the ground um, around temporary and permanent accommodations and the safety and security of the resettlement staff who work in RAP centers, as well as our government sponsored refugee clients has been paramount. So we appreciate all the work that's happening across the province. We're ensuring uh, that communication lines with our resettlement service providers remain wide open and we're ensuring that personal protective equipment needs are met so that people can be safely quarantined. The newcomer and refugee experience continues to be positively impacted by the work that you do and newcomers are still being resettled and have access to the support they need. Like you, we at IRCC have adapted to teleworking and moving forward with our business of settling Canada's newcomers. We have been working hard to implement our departmental priorities in particular, continuing to deliver high quality settlement services in a COVID environment and supporting the resumption of resettlement services during this time. We're also focused on Francophone immigration and uh, many of the pilots that are happening across the country, including the Atlantic Immigration Pilot and the Rural and Northern Affairs and uh, Rural and Northern Integration Pilot. For the panel today, uh, Debbie has asked us to touch on three key topics, uh, women and economic recovery, how the department uh, supported organizations during the pandemic, as well as our vision uh, for the new normal of immigrant and refugee services. So I'll start with women and economic recovery. Dans le dernier discours du trône, le gouvernement fédéral a reconnu que les femmes, en particulier les femmes à faible revenu, sont les plus touchées par le COVID-19. Les effets de cette crise ont été décrits comme une récession au féminin. Il a été annoncé dans les discours du trône que le gouvernement fédéral allait créer un plan d'action pour les femmes dans l'économie afin d'aider davantage des femmes à retourner sur le marché du travail et de veiller à gérer la pandémie et la reprise d'un point de vue féministe et intersectionnel. So in the recent speech from the throne, the federal government acknowledged that women, and in particular low-income women, have been hit hardest by COVID-19. This crisis has been described as a she session. It was announced in the speech from the throne that the federal government would create an action plan for women in the economy to help more women get back into the workforce and to ensure a feminist intersectional response to this pandemic and recovery. In alignment with this pledge, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada has been committed to ensuring the vulnerable clients, groups that have access to and advancement within the Canadian labour market, including a focus on newcomer women and visible minority women in particular. As you know, many newcomer women and visible minority women face multiple barriers, including gender and race-based discrimination, lack of community and social supports, lengthy absence from the labor market, which can result in a lack of self-confidence. With this commitment in mind, uh, back in 2018, IRCC provided funding to existing uh, partners to implement employment-related programming with a focus on visible minority newcomer women. And the department also launched an, I'm so sorry. The department also launched, my high tech uh, stand isn't working so well. The department also launched a new pilot, um, the Visible Minority Newcomer Women in Employment Pilot with the aim of engaging new partners on projects that specifically address multiple barriers to labor market entry and career advancement faced by visible minority newcomer women in Canada. Uh, the expression of interest had focused on two main themes. Uh, first was improving employment outcomes, ac access to and progress within the labor market for visible minority newcomer women through or previously demonstrated interventions. And the second was establishing and enhancing the capacity of previously non-funded organizations to deliver these services. En se concentrant également sur trois priorités, innovation, renforcement des capacités et culture numérique, IRCC visait à financer des projets susceptibles de produire de nombreux résultats positifs pour cette population vulnérable. 
Les candidats retenus ont, été, ont reçu des fonds pour offrir des programmes aidant les clients à acquérir des connaissances, des compétences et des contacts afin de se préparer et de participer et de s'intégrer avec succès au marché du travail canadien. Des services indirects ont également été financés dans le but d'aider nos partenaires à fournir des services d'établissement et des services communautaires adaptés et coordonnés, notamment en aidant les communautés à favoriser un environnement d'accueil accueillant pour les immigrants. So, the program also focused on three priorities, innovation, capacity building, and digital literacy. IRCC aimed to fund projects that would deliver many positive outcomes for this vulnerable population. Successful applicants have been funded to provide programs that are helping clients acquire new skills and connections in order to prepare for and participate and successfully integrate into the Canadian labor market. Indirect services were also funded with the goal of helping our partners deliver a responsive and coordinated settlement and community services, including assisting communities to foster a welcoming environment for immigrants. IRCC funded 38 projects overall, um, both with both new and existing partners, and 15 of these projects were in Ontario. Many of the projects that were directly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic were able to quickly pivot to a virtual delivery model and ensure the best possible outcome for these clients. The department is continuing the implementation and ongoing assessment of the results of the Visible Minority Newcomer Women pilot. And in addition to monitoring projects with new partners and the testing phase of the pilot with the Social Research and Demonstration Corporation is evaluating the effectiveness of specific labor market intervention combinations for these newcomer clients. The program interventions being tested were informed by broad consultations, including consultations with refugee women, and these results will be used to inform the design and delivery of employment-related services for newcomer women offered under the settlement program in the future. This work is proceeding within the current operation environment under COVID, and all direct service delivery moved to online and virtual, and some adjustments to the project parameters were required, Um, which included some delayed work placements, but overall online delivery has been uh, a big success and we continue to, to expect good results out of this project. Many learnings and most effective uh, during the poor economic conditions as well as we continue to support visible minority newcomer women during the economic recovery. I do so have some examples of projects, but in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll continue on to the next section. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer to those at the end. The pandemic supports that we provided um, over the past several months have been numerous and uh, we've had ongoing communications with the sector. When the pandemic first hit, it was unfamiliar territory for all of us. And we had to adjust cautiously, but swiftly at the same time. I found it incredibly inspiring to see how the service provider organizations across the country came together with IRCC and worked really efficiently to put forth action plans to follow local and provincial public health guidelines to allow us to pivot to alternative service delivery. Le, le ministère a réagi de manière proactive et a fait preuve de souplesse pour so soutenir les, les nouveaux arrivants et les réfugiés dans leur parcours d'intégration. Le ministère a mis en place des mesures provisoires pendant la période de pandémie pour, pour permettre au secteur d'atteindre ses objectifs et ses cibles et de veiller à ce que les besoins des immigrants soient satisfaits. So the department reacted proactively and, shown, and has shown a lot of flexibility to support service provider organizations to continue their work with newcomers and refugees on their integration journey. Within this flexibility, the department has put in place temporary measures through the pandemic period to assist the sector in meeting these goals and targets and ensuring immigrants' needs are met. So in March, we worked uh, with IRCC funded organizations to move from manually generating our signed contribution agreements to e-signatures, uh, which was a very new technology to us. Um, but it worked beautifully and it allowed us to sign over 700 agreements uh, before the end of March 2020 uh, to ensure the continuity of services. So that was really critical for us at the beginning of the pandemic. Our department created a centralized COVID-19 response mailbox for all service providers to submit their questions and request assistance. Uh, we received a lot of inquiries here and this really helped to shape 
and implement the temporary measures that we put in place. We've also created a web page that you can go to at any time with information for service providers regarding service delivery in the context of COVID-19, which has been updated regularly. Those updates were being formed by questions and input that we received from you. In addition, due to COVID and closures of in-person services, IRCC put in place interim procedures and tools to allow recipients to continue to deliver language assessments and collect results. These adapted measures continue to connect newcomers to available language training, which expanded support for online course delivery and ensured quality language training options remain available. The validity period of language assessment results has also been extended from one to two years and existing assessment tools have been adapted. This allows language assessment and referral centers to assess and refer potential learners to IRCC funded online or remote language classes in Canada. And we also have new waitlist management and language referral guidelines that were developed to ensure a consistent national approach to managing waitlists, such as promoting collaboration between language training providers and to offer available service, uh, available language training seats to clients on waitlists at different organizations in the area. Other measures we put in place included extending reporting deadlines where needed, um, such as the annual project performance reports and annual performance reports for community partnerships, as well as eye care reporting and the final claim, because we understood that the pressures and priorities on service providers uh, had to shift uh, to the delivery of services during this time. We also um, provided monitoring tools and procedures, um, or sorry, we've also adapted our monitoring tools and procedures and uh, tried to streamline uh, our processes, both to suit the remote implementation and to try to lessen the administrative burden and pressures on providers and, and on our staff as well. And we also committed to not implementing any financial penalties throughout the decommitment, through the decommitment of funds if service providers had to reduce their services due to the pandemic. Any COVID related slippage could be reallocated for purchases such as laptops and cell phones and adaptive technology, as well as PPE for the return of in-person services. And our Assistant Deputy Minister Fraser Valentine uh, sent out a further message uh, on this September 25th to our service provider organizations to outline the importance of maximizing these investments and identifying any slippage to uh, early to address priorities. We appreciate how close you all have been working with your IRCC officers to reallocate what you can uh, and what you may not be able to spend this fiscal year. Recipients with slippage and program delivery um, caused uh, directly by service disruptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic can also receive an exception that would allow program delivery funds to be decoupled from administrative funds in certain circumstances. Therefore, you wouldn't have any, any um, burden to your organizations in that respect. Dès le début de la pandémie, nous, nous nous sommes engagés à ce que les agents d'IRCC communiquent régulièrement et fréquemment avec les fournisseurs de services. Cela a cours depuis les huit derniers mois et notre engagement à assurer cette communication est continu en temps opportun uh, pour uh, se poursuit. Right at the start of the pandemic, we committed to consistent and frequent communications from IRCC officers to service providers. This has not changed and over the past eight months, uh, our commitment to this ongoing and timely communication continues. So please don't hesitate to contact your project officers if you have any questions. So lastly, I'll talk a little bit about the new normal. Um, so we do continue to work closely with you to, to try to better understand the context on the ground your challenges uh, and to try to quickly address emerging issues that may impact service delivery and your clients. The settlement services shifted to online delivery at the start of the pandemic. And as we embrace our new normal, some service providers have elected to begin returning to in-person services where it is safe to do so. Our department will continue to support the transition and work with the sector to support the path of delivery that you choose, whether it be through a hybrid model of on-site and virtual service delivery combined, whether it be remote delivery, or if you're able, the full return to in-person services in a safe and secure way. On October 15th, IRCC launched a new funding opportunity under the latest expression of interest for a new suite of service delivery improvement projects 
with a focus on COVID-19 adaptation and recovery. Projects uh, under this new expression of interest um, are asked to, uh, projects for this new selection of, uh, of interest are asked to submit their projects under one of three priorities. The first is harnessing technology to support remote service delivery. The second is increasing employer involvement and settlement. And the third is supporting sector resilience through social research and development and enhancing activities and programs surrounding anti-racism. And so uh, the, the uh, funding available is um, 30 million per year over the next three years. And we look forward to receiving uh, your letters of interest for this new opportunity under the Service Delivery Improvement Fund. The objectives of the SDI funding is to develop new and innovative approaches to program delivery and capacity building and to better meet the needs of newcomers through their integration journey. It also helps to strengthen IRCC's understanding of service delivery methods. The total funding for uh, across Canada for this uh, for this envelope is just over 33 million per year over the next three years. And so you can find more information on the SDI uh, expression of interest on our funding page. So in closing, uh, last month, the federal government provided its update on immigration through the speech from the throne. The place of immigration was a key ingredient to the success for growth and recovery of the country. And this reconfirms the government's commitment to the work in the settlement sector and its dedication to becoming the world's top destination for talent, capital, and jobs. In a few short days, our minister will announce the immigration levels for the coming year. As our ADM Fraser Valentine has reiterated in his recent message to the sector, IRCC is aware that this has a direct impact on all of you. And we are committed to having an open dialogue with you on the government's plan and we will continue to work together to ensure the settlement of newcomers and refugees is a, is a success as we together continue through and recover from this pandemic. Thanks very much, Debbie, for your time and for the opportunity to speak to the panel today. Thank you, Laura. Um, Jomen? Thank you, Debbie. Uh, that was... Uh very well done Laura and big shoes you feel now but it's also good because uh, some of the stuff that you you mentioned I just started taking that taking them out of my own presentation so um, I will be uh, quick to during my own presentation this morning so I am the acting director for the national division at the department of women and gender equality um, the uh, mandate of our organization is to promote equality for women and to uh, get them to uh, fully participate in the social, economic, and democratic life in Canada. Um, we are a very small organization with a very small budget. Uh, right now, we are an organization with approximately 350 employees. So we're considered to be one of the smallest uh, departments in the federal government family. We also uh, work out of uh, four, five points of services. So our headquarters is located in, uh, in Gatineau. Uh, our Toronto office, uh, which uh, uh, serves the entire population is located in Toronto. And then part of the staff also works out of the Ottawa office. Uh, the Montreal office looks after the Quebec and the Nunavut regions. Moncton office in New Brunswick looks after the uh, four Atlantic provinces. And then the Edmonton office in Alberta um, takes care of the four uh, Western provinces and two other territories. Um, at Women and Gender Equality, we have two funding programs. We have the Gender-Based Violence Program, and we also have the uh, Women's Program. The, prog the Women's Program basically uh, funds um, organization to tackle institutional barriers that prevent women and all women to uh, access services and support. So we provide organization funding to organization to work with uh, different systems, different institutions to ensure that any barriers to women's empowerment is, uh, is removed, is worked on. So um, we do that through 
of funding pillars, which includes ending violence against women and girls, encouraging women and, and girls in leadership and decision-making roles, and uh, improving women improving women and girls' economic prosperity and security. And as I mentioned, uh, we also have a newly added gender-based violence for which we got funding uh, starting in 2018, I believe. And I, if, and I think some of the uh, uh, organizations at this table uh, have received funding under the gender-based violence program. Uh, we have two funding streams. Um, the first one is the continuous intake. We accept over the over the, the year a small amount of applications and on ongoing program on an ongoing basis. Um, so if there's anything that comes up, anything that needs to for us to react on a momentum that we need to react on right away, we will entertain uh, um, a continuous intake application. So I will encourage you to talk to your regional offices about any uh, opportunities under the continuous intake stream. But our main funding sources uh, happens through uh, calls for proposals. Uh, we do targeted call for proposal on specific themes, each with a number of predetermined elements and application deadlines. Uh, recently, over the past few months, we had um, a call for proposal to uh, increase the LGBTQ sector capacity. And we also recently just wrapped up a call for proposal on human trafficking. Results will be announced in the few in the coming months. Um, with regards to funding in 2018, which received a historic uh, funding uh, amount of about $100 million to uh, support women's organizational capacity, this was the first time that which was uh, funding organizations to look inwards rather than outwards. As I mentioned, the regular women's program funding is to tackle systemic barriers, but this time we, um, the minister really wanted to uh, ensure that organizations look inwards and how to become more sustainable in order to improve the, the, the women's movement in Canada. And this was the first time that we were able to fund specific women's organizations to work under um, strategic um, strategic plans, uh, looking at other funding streams, uh, developing their advocacy um, uh, processes, or uh, looking at um, developing any resource that will help them improve their internal capacity. For this funding, over 250, 260 women's organizations receive funding, and uh, organizations are now working to implement um, the projects. Now with COVID, we realized that some of the uh, activities that were planned under to happen this year have been put on hold because um, as Laura mentioned, um, you know, the sh there's, a, there's been a shift in, 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 in what in the priorities for, for a lot of the organization. So we are working with each and every recipient to ensure that you know, we're supporting them and we're coming to them, coming at them to see what can we, how can we support you to ensure that you continue to support your membership, to support your organization, so your members, but also are able to continue your project in a way that is very responsible and, 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 and really um, unique to your organization. So I will encourage all of the recipient of the capacity building funding or any other funding for that matter, to speak to your program officer, to speak to your region, to see what kind of flexibilities you want to put in place, because we don't want you to, you know, to lose your funding. We don't want you to, you know, have this added pressure of, of, uh, of having to implement your project when you don't have the capacity, you know, your, your, your interest, your priority is somewhere else. So I encourage you to contact your regional office, to contact your program officer and have the conversation. We will work with you. We will support you in any way that we can to ensure that, you know, your needs are met first before, you know, the project needs are also met. Um, I will not go into uh, uh, some of the flexibilities. Laura had mentioned that, uh, um, their program have allowed organization to extend the deadlines. We're also doing the same things. We are extending the, the deadlines for the deliverables that were set in your agreement with on, on these projects. So if you're not able to meet them, if you're not able to submit your reports in time, it, you know, 
talk to your account, uh, your program officer, and we will work with you to to make sure that we're meeting your needs. Um, in terms of the impact of the pandemic, um, we all know that COVID-19 has exacerbated the systemic inequality issues faced by different groups of people. And among those that are affected, uh, we have racialized women, low-income women, uh, women with disabilities, and uh, indigenous women. So we, you know, this this pandemic has shown really how vulnerable these population, are, more vulnerable these populations are. So we know that uh, women are overrepresented in low-income occupations. And um, I read a report um, recently as I was preparing for this for this meeting today, and there's something that says report shows that half of all female workers are uh, employed in, occupation, in occupations involving the five C's, you know, the caring, the clerical, catering, cashiering, and cleaning. And those are what we call in regular terms, frontline work. So, and we know that uh, um, a, a, an important in, uh, a percentage of nurses have uh, either lost their jobs or have been reassigned elsewhere. Um, so we, and I like the word she session. I like that uh, Laura had that. I thought it was my, my, my word that I found in, a, in one of the, the, the documents. But the reality of the moment makes everybody calling it she sessions because again, women are predominantly uh, working in, in the, in, in, uh, as frontline workers. So, and as such, they're usually the first to go when these things happen. So I'm glad that uh, economists found that word there and, and you know, we will continue to bring these, these issues forward. We also know from reports that uh, GBV has really, really increased. Gender-based violence has increased and will continue to increase during the pandemic. Women's shelters, uh, uh, shelters across Canada, sexual assault centers have been struggling to prevent and manage the increase in, in the demands. And um, so in March, uh, the prime minister announced a funding of about of $50 million to uh, support uh, women uh, violence against women shelters and sexual assault centers to support them in order, in order to help them manage the capacity and on so uh, their capacity to manage or prevent outbreaks in their facilities. So out of this money, $40 million was given to WAGE. And um, we worked with uh, the two national organizations, the Canadian Women's Foundation, who uh, was used to distribute money to um, sexual assault centers across Canada and uh, organization providing important GBV services to uh, organizations in Canada. We also work with uh, Women's Shelters Canada to distribute funding to uh, um, shelters um, in, in shelters across Canada and have to say uh, ex excluding Quebec because we had a separate agreement with the province of Quebec. So, um, so far this money has been distributed. They're not huge amounts. Uh, I believe each of the se uh, sexual assault center and JBV organizations each got $25,000 to, uh, to help them support the continuing and continuing to provide services to their clients. And so far we've helped, we've supported 93 sexual assault centers and approximately 329 uh, GBV organizations. Uh, 20 million were provided to Women's Shelters Canada to distribute to shelters across Canada. And um, each shelter received a base funding of $32,000 and they supported about 432 shelters. But the, the shelter money was div divided into two uh, streams. You know, every shelter in Canada, of, um, sorry, every shelter in Canada received a base funding of $32,000. And then after that, Women's Shelters Canada went back to this organization and asked if they, were need, they needed um, extra funding, extra uh, support. And 76% of those organizations came back and said, yes, we need more money. So there was an extra uh, 31,000 that was provided to all shelters. Now the Inuit shelters, because of the 
the increased need got um, $65,000 more. So it made for each uh, Inuit shelter to get, I believe the mama was $97,000 and each of the other shelters across Canada got a total of $61,000 or almost $62,000. So we do recognize that they're not huge amounts of funding, but at least from what we've heard so far, it's enough, it's been okay for them to, to support the really, really emerging needs of women, you know, um, so that they're able to continue to offer these services to women. And if you listen to the news in early October, there was another announcement of an extra $50,000, uh, which will help continue to um, support these organizations. So we're currently working to, um, <coughs> sorry, to develop some parameters about this funding and information will be shared in the next coming days about how to access to the new 50 million. I will stop now and um, to provide um, Yvonne the time to, 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 you know, to have her own, uh, to do her own presentation and will be available to answer any, any questions. Merci, Jomé. Yvonne? Hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for um, having me uh, with you this morning. Um, I uh, join uh, typically Ocasi uh, in uh, some form of panel every year, so it's really good to be back. Um, uh, typically, um, when I join uh, the Ocasi panels, I'm wearing um, exclusively my um, uh, immigration programs hat, um, but this year um, I have expanded responsibilities. Uh, for the past year, uh, I have been I have had responsibility for the um, design and delivery of uh, newcomer support services, and that includes uh, settlement newcomers the newcomer settlement program and language training, as well as uh, programs that support uh, women through violence prevention and economic empowerment programs and services. Um, so I will represent my two um, portfolios today. Um, in addition, I should mention um, uh, both um, immigration and uh, women's issues are housed within a large ministry, uh, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. Um, so that means that uh, within our ministry, uh, beyond our two uh, divisions, there are uh, a number of uh, program areas uh, that uh, support uh, a range of uh, violence against women services and supports, including counseling and women's shelter shelters, um, but that is part of another division. Um, I would like to take a moment uh, to uh, thank you every, thank you all for your work and dedication uh, to continue to support newcomers and women in an extremely challenging uh, time and within a very complex operational environment uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, the response that we have seen uh, from service providing organizations has been uh, incredible. Uh, organizations have been resource, resourceful and creative and, uh, and have um, very quickly uh, shifted um, uh, to adapt services to online delivery and to um, adopt new modalities of service delivery, as well as to uh, respond um, uh, in new ways to uh, meet client needs. And that has, in some cases, included distribution of food and other essentials, providing equipment to clients, uh, to keep them connected to services, and in some cases to keep women safe. Uh, so there has been uh, a lot of crea creativity um, and uh, in how uh, this sector has responded uh, to a very um, challenging and quickly uh, evolving environment. Uh, my remarks uh, will focus on the three items uh, that uh, Debbie asked uh, panelists to address. So the impact of the pandemic on women, racialized communities, and newcomers, um, uh, the response uh, to the sector and to um, uh, newcomers and women clients to mitigate impact, 
and uh, the emerging trends and, uh, and issues that we're seeing that are informing uh, our vision for uh, recovery and for a post-pandemic um, uh, future. Um, COVID and the uh, public health measures uh, to contain the spread, as uh, my uh, co-panelists have uh, identified, have exacerbated um, social and economic inequalities, uh, with women, newcomers, and racialized communities being among the worst affected. And my two portfolios, immigration and women's programs, um, can be expected uh, to play a critical role in the recovery process. Uh, over the coming months and years. Um, so I'll begin with um, immigration. With respect to the impact of COVID on immigrants, uh, we know we've seen that the evidence shows that newcomers have been very severely impacted by uh, COVID-related job losses. Um, as well as uh, what we're seeing uh, is that immigrant employment has also been uh, recovering at a, at a much slower pace compared to um, Canadian-born uh, workers. Uh, newcomers and racialized workers um, are also more likely to be employed, as others have noted, in jobs and industries uh, that don't allow for remote work, or the, and that means that they are um, at, uh, at a higher risk of contracting uh, the coronavirus. In particular, newcomers and racialized workers are overrepresented in precarious work, uh, where they're less likely to have uh, benefits like sick leave or strong occupational health and safety protections. Uh, we have seen outbreaks um, in uh, the agricultural sector, meatpacking plants, and long-term care facilities, uh, which have taken a heavy toll on uh, these um, communities. Um, a similar trend can be observed with regards to the health impacts. Uh, while newcomers represent just over 25% of the population, uh, they made up over 43% of COVID-19 um, cases in Ontario as of mid-June. Uh, newcomers and racialized communities also face uh, increased mental health uh, st stressors and increased risk of domestic violence, uh, and that's exacerbated by health risks, financial pressures, and um, difficult living conditions. Um, while Black and racialized residents represent uh, about half of the population in Toronto, uh, they account for 83% of COVID cases. And this is uh, the race-based um, data collection that was, has been in place. Um, this is based on the, the, the race-based data collection that has been in place, uh, in place since May. Uh, we also know from a uh, um, uh, CAMH uh, report and uh, reports and evidence uh, that low income individuals are two times more likely to report uh, having trouble coping with mental health issues. Um, and likewise, uh, people of color are more likely to report having trouble coping and are twice more likely to worry about being safe from domestic violence. Um, so that is what we know um, from some of the evidence uh, at this stage. Uh, with regards to women, uh, we also know that women have been uh, disproportionately impacted by uh, COVID-related job losses, and especially women with lower levels of formal education. Um, and we also know that uh, immigrant women have been um, uh, severely impacted by job loss. Uh, women also have additional barriers to, uh, return, uh, to returning to the workplace uh, due to child care and elder care uh, responsibilities. Like immigrants, uh, women are overrepresented in precarious uh, and uh, low wage jobs, as um, my co panelists have mentioned. And uh, some of the, those functions cannot be performed remotely, which as well puts them at, at uh, increased uh, risk of exposure to um, COVID. Um, with regards to health and safety, uh, women uh, uh, have also been uh, severely impacted. Uh, the group with the largest uh, number of COVID diagnoses in Canada is women aged 20 to 29. Um, health risks for women are increased by their concentration in healthcare and personal support roles. 
and uh, women uh, constitute 79% 79, 79 of employment in the health occupations in Ontario. Um, so that's very, very significant. Um, women organizations have warned uh, that violence against women is also being uh, exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, there has been a documented increase in gender-based um, violence reports since the pandemic began. And uh, women's crisis uh, centers have received, are seeing an increase um, in intake uh, to their shelters and transitional housing. Um, as well as domestic violence helplines are also reporting uh, increased call volumes. Um, in response to the um, challenges that COVID has uh, presented, like other levels of government, um, our ministry um, uh, announced funding flexibility measures uh, to allow organizations to adapt their services to changing needs and to meet public health requirements, specifically, uh, our service delivery partners were given flexibility to shift funding within uh, their organizations and across programs to focus on critical services and needs related to COVID and flexibility to go beyond the traditional 15% administrative cap on um, spending, on administrative spending. As well, funding stability um, uh, has been provided um, uh, in the context of uh, fluctuations in service demand and uh, organizational, organizational ability to uh, meet service, service delivery targets that typically would have been established before COVID. Uh, this flexibility was intended to help agencies respond to, uh, to the evolving needs of clients. Uh, to allow agencies to adapt and to innovate, um, offering um, um, uh, um, to pay attention to mental health needs, uh, to supporting organizations to um, uh, uh, adjust services, and to um, bring um, uh, um, to bring um, to be able to essentially maintain stability. Um, uh, in terms of funding, but also in terms of services to clients. Um, one of the things that uh, we're not able to do, and I want to take this opportunity to highlight, uh, because I know it's uh, um, uh, important for organizations, uh, is to uh, carry funds forward from one fiscal year to the next. Um, we, um, um, as you know, um, there are fluctuations in, in demand. Some organizations are able to, um, are continuing to spend their budgets at um, uh, the expected rates. Some organizations are seeing, um, are finding difficulty um, in spending other budgets because uh, of uh, the, uh, different uh, differences in, in client uptake. Um, we are not able to allow carryover of funding. However, um, the, the flexibility measures do allow organizations to shift funding uh, uh, for, uh, to other areas of need within their organizations. So I know that at, at around this time, over the coming weeks, typically uh, organizations that we fund uh, send in their interim uh, reports. Uh, so I would encourage everyone uh, who um, is uh, um, finding it difficult to spend their budgets to contact their program um, consultants in our ministry uh, to talk about options because there is flexibility to shift funding. Uh, so I don't want to get to the end of the fiscal year um, uh, without a plan, essentially. And, and certainly organizations have uh, the ability to um, uh, uh, respond to COVID, uh, to um, think about ways to support recovery, uh, to think about ways to, um, or to, to, to invest funding in, 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 in activities that help to meet clients' needs, uh, that support virtual delivery. All of those are certainly opportunities. Uh, beyond um, the flexibility measures that uh, we announced uh, for the organizations that we fund, I don't want to go into um, uh, all the details, but I wanted to mention that um, uh, there have been other provincial initiatives that may be of interest to uh, everyone uh, in the sector. Uh, I'm very quickly going to mention some of those. Uh, that uh, includes expansion of mental health support and addiction, and addiction services, including virtual and online services. 
um, uh, and uh, the Resilient Communities Fund uh, to help nonprofit organizations rebuild and, and recover, recover from COVID-19. Um, there was also an announcement of some additional funding focused on Black children, youth, and families uh, to address the, 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 the impact on, 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 on that community, on those communities. Um, there was some additional funding uh, focused on uh, victims of gender-based violence and human trafficking um, also. Um, there were measures to recruit, retain, and support healthcare workers, uh, including personal support workers, um, as well as um, a pandemic paid top-up uh, for frontline workers. Uh, that was a top up of four um, dollars per hour for eligible workers uh, in healthcare, social services, and, and the correction sector. And I know that uh, in some instances, uh, some settlement organizations and with many women's organizations were able to benefit from that. And uh, there was also expansion of mental health services for children and youth. Uh, in the range of about 24 or 25 million. Um, those are obviously the not, uh, uh, announcements uh, and um, beyond my ministry, but I thought that uh, it's worth mentioning because uh, they support the clients that um, uh, the women's sector and the uh, newcomer sector support. Um, with regards to some of the trends and challenges um, uh, that, um, that are exacerbated by the pandemic. I just want to run through a few of those because they're uh, the kinds of uh, factors that are shaping um, our vision for the future and uh, in terms of being able to respond uh, uh, to recovery and the post-pandemic reality. So as uh, my uh, co-panelists have mentioned, racism and structural inequality, um, the pandemic has highlighted uh, inequities in multiple spheres, uh, including healthcare, education, and the economy. Um, we're seeing fluctuations in service demand, and many service providers report good retention of existing clients, uh, but challenges um, reaching um, new clients. Um, we know that language assessment is down dramatically. And language uh, providers, ESL, FSL, um, are projecting a decline in learners and uh, course offerings. Uh, however, we are seeing um, uh, employment-related language training offerings um, uh, increase. Uh, so that's a good thing. They're having privacy concerns related to the shift to online delivery, uh, which has highlighted the need for policies and um, to, ens that, to ensure that privacy and secure uh, that there is privacy and secure exchange of documents and information in a remote uh, delivery environment. Um, we have um, uh, seen uh, digital literacy and access challenge, uh, challenges. Many client households have limited access to computers uh, and or to the internet and digital literacy is a challenge for many uh, making access to all online services difficult and for the foreseeable future, online deli delivery will continue to be a strong feature uh, in, in, in our sector. Um, service eligibility and access to documents has also been challenging in the immigration context. Uh, immigration processing constraints have left some clients in limbo, um, waiting for eligibility interviews and refugee claim and papers. Uh, work permits, uh, permits and permanent residence, um, residence cards uh, in some instances have been impacted as well. Uh, with regards to employment, uh, both newcomers and women are facing new barriers uh, to finding employment. And for many sectors, um, job fairs, recruitment and interviews have shifted online, um, which um, calls for new job search strategies and skills. And, uh, and also um, in terms of helping to prepare clients um, uh, for, um, for jobs or for new jobs or for some of the shifts that we're seeing in the labor, labor market will require um, uh, a bit of a rethink uh, in how we deliver em employment and training supports to clients and how we connect with employers as well. So looking to the future, uh, some of the um, uh, issues um, uh, that will be critical for economic recovery include uh, improving access to technology, to, the, uh, to technology and to the skills required to use technology effectively, 
um, focusing on employment related needs and prioritizing targeted and customized employment and training supports, uh, facilitating access to flexible and affordable childcare, particularly to help women uh, uh, regain it or re regain or return to the workforce, uh, regain employment or, or uh, join the, the workforce, paying attention to mental health, well being, and social connections, which have been uh, disrupted by um, uh, the current situation, um, supporting organizations to adapt and to meet uh, public health requirements and bringing a gender, a gender justice and a, an anti-racism lens uh, to funding and to design of programs and services um, uh, in both sectors and, and beyond. Um, just a couple of concluding comments. Um, so we're currently focused as, there, as uh, uh, those organizations that receive funding from women's issues or um, new, uh, our newcomer services. Um, uh, we are currently focused on ensuring financial stability and flexibility to support service providing organizations uh, to continue to adapt services and delivery approaches. Um, uh, so uh, looking to next year, uh, while decisions have not been um, finalized and I'm not in a position to communicate the approach um, for uh, funding next year, um, uh, the um, what we're looking at is, you know, ensuring continued um, flexibility and, uh, and stability. Uh, so that's probably all I can say for now. Um, at the same time, we continue to work towards adapting and, and improving our programs. We're uh, completing uh, program reviews. Uh, you, many of you know, you know that we had um, been working on a program review uh, of settlement and language training services, and that was in part in response to Auditor General recommendations. Um, uh, provided to us in 2017. Um, uh, the pandemic uh, delayed that process to some degree, but also um, um, uh, shifted our focus to a new reality and to thinking about how any program redesign and um, needs to take into account what we're seeing um, uh, in the pandemic context and to plan for the future. Uh, so we continue to work on uh, strategies to improve and adapt our programs so and, and to identify strategies to respond to this new reality. Uh, we anticipate seeing a gradual shift, uh, but significant actually growth uh, in demand for services um, over the next months and, and years. Um, certainly, uh, you know, once the pandemic um, uh, uh, situation is over. And we know that we need to adjust our own programs to make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're they're well sufficient to support the sector, uh, but also to respond to more acute client needs um, that we anticipate to see over the you know the, not only months but years to come. So I think I'll stop there, and uh, I know that uh, we probably will get a lot of questions. So uh, thank you, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne, and to Jamin and Laura. Thank you for your opening remarks. Um, very informative. I have a number, a couple of questions, but I wanted to get to the technical questions first from our audience, as you can imagine. Um, Laura, let me come to you first. Um, is IRCC considering um, allowing the service organizations to move funds from one fiscal year to the next? Unmute yourself, please. Yes, my challenge of my special uh, <laughs> holder here. Um, uh, sorry, the question is on uh, transferring on funds from one fiscal year to the next. Yes. And so as, as Yvonne has said, normally we aren't able to carry forward funds um, from one fiscal year to the next. But last year, uh, we started a pilot um, to look at um, uh, how we could have organizations retain unexpended uh, balances from that current fiscal year. And so uh, we're, um, we've got the result, or we're working on the results of that pilot. It was a fairly small pilot. Uh, I think we had about 11 organizations that participated, but the results are very promising. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to continue with that pilot this year. Um, and so uh, what I would recommend is that you contact your, uh, your, sorry, contact no your problem. project officer, 
contact your project officer to to discuss um, the opportunity to retain uh, uh, unexpended balances uh, from your um, from your contribution agreements this year. Now there are a lot of kind of restrictions. It's it's um, it's it's a uh, unusual process for us to undertake, but uh, we do have uh, some um, protocols in place to be able to allow it. So the amount may not, I think the, the maximum that we're currently looking at is potentially $50,000. So it's not huge amounts, but it could still make a difference um, in being able to retain some of that funding. Our, our goal is always to, to keep as much funding as possible um, going to uh, providing services to, to clients. And so I think it's in the best interest of, of both uh, our, our programs and, and, and service providers to be able to try and find a, a good, uh, a good uh, balance there. I can, I can hear and see the fists in the air um, as you're saying it's a possibility. Um, and along the similar line for those who are currently funded through SDI, um, will they be able to request and receive a three to four month extension um, of their projects? So again, here um, I think we've been in contact with most of the organizations uh, that are currently that currently have projects under SDI to to uh, to uh, discuss the possibility of extensions. We had received quite a number of, of requests at the beginning of, of the pandemic, and so we're currently reviewing uh, those opportunities. And uh, um, there are a number of criteria again that that we had to put in place in order to be considered. And so um, once we're, we're um, we've completed that process, we'll be able to inform those organizations that we'll be able to continue. Um, and we're hoping to be able to inform you kind of be before the end of this, uh, this calendar year. Thank you. Um, Yvonne, um, in your presentation at the end, you, you I think, anticipated this question um, ar around what happens post-March 20, 2021. And so the question is, um, what kind of hope um, or what kind of indication can you give to organizations that are provincially funded, um, both for the Newcomer Settlement Program for Language as well as for the women's programming, IWF, um, Investing in Women's Futures. What, what commitments or what sense can you give them that the program will continue post-2021? Sure, Debbie. Um, so yeah, I try to signal, I can obviously, I, I can, I'm not in a position to provide a commitment. Uh, I can certainly tell you what the thinking is. Um, until um, you know everything is approved, uh, you know I obviously cannot make a commitment. Uh, but uh, I try to signal that uh, I mean we're looking at maintaining stability and um, uh, beyond March 31st, um, uh, we have uh, several contracts uh, uh, that end um, in newcomer settlement. Uh, many of the women's issues. Uh, programs um, and a couple of others uh, that end in March. Uh, we're looking at, at, at maintaining stability next year um, while at the same time uh, finalizing work on program review and redesign and, uh, and uh, um, anticipate that um, following that phase of program review and redesign, uh, we're anticipating a call for proposals um, uh, on for multi-year um, funding award of you know three to five years, whatever that period is. I know that uh, IRCC moves to five years, and uh, and you know and that's that, that's a good model. So we, I think we're still thinking about what you know what we can do. Um, uh, so with regards to language, so we just language our language training uh, currently operates based on the school year. So we just rolled out funding for the for the school year that began in September, and that will go until um, the end of August. So it, 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 it's uh, we have a bit of a different model uh, at this point. Uh, for every, so I expect that over the coming weeks, uh, I will be communicating uh, the approach uh, to the to the organizations that we fund. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, if there are any specific uh, concerns or questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Organizations should, should feel free to reach out to me or to their program consultants um, uh, in our ministry. Um, but uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, working on the approach for next year, and uh, very much uh, what, you know, what we very much want to focus on stability and um, flexibility and uh, capacity to respond. Thank you. 
Um, Germain, um, in your presentation, you mentioned um, factually that the wage is one of the smallest departments um, in the federal government. Given the impact on women and especially on racialized and immigrant um, and newcomer women, um, what's the thinking um, in your shop around how that will change post pandemic or as part of the pandemic recovery? Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we've been, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, because we're a small department, for the longest time we had a very, very small uh, funding budget. But uh, last year, <clears throat> sorry, last year in 2019, we did get a, a huge in, influx in funding. We had a, a 160 million. Um, influx in funding that was provided to wage. So there are some projects that are being funded at this time, but there are also decisions that are being taken into place to ensure that uh, the, the organization, the communities that were not um, necessarily targeted and in past call for proposals or past funding decisions are being made at this time. Something that I, I neglected to mention is that wage is also the department responsible for implementing gender-based analysis plus in the federal government. So while we're supporting other organizations implementing the GBA plus strategies, we're also doing the same thing in ours, um, adding that intersectionality lens into our funding. So you will notice in the, in the coming, um, in the future cost for proposals that um, racialized communities, immigrant and refugee women will be kind of the, one of the targeted groups that were focusing on because again, unfortunately they were not, they haven't been really present in our funding strategies in the past. So we're trying to correct that right now. And you will see that uh, that's changing. And, and, and I'm actually glad that it is. And I'm actually glad that we're, we're using that GPA plus lens. We're using that intersectionality and to ensure that uh, the populations are covered um, the, the, geographically, we're also covering the whole, you know, the entire country. So stay tuned on that one. Thank you. Um, you must have anticipated my question around how do you center the plus in GBA plus. Um, but for Yvonne and Laura as well, the recovery without, one of our colleagues says, the recovery without targeted funding for people who are impacted most severely by the pandemic will exacerbate the systemic inequalities. How are funders going to ensure that services for women and people of color are prioritized? So Jemaine just talked about um, the fact that their funding going forward will um, target specifically around issues of race um, and, and other issues, issues of disability. Um, what about um, the provincial government, Yvonne, through um, the Immigration and Women's Program and Laura through IRCC? What are some of your thinking there? Um, who wants to start? Yvonne? Yes, sure, I can go. Um, yeah, so there is, um, I mean, that's a very good point. And uh, I don't think anybody would disagree with that uh, within government. Uh, there has been, I mean, there is acknowledgement and there has, uh, of, uh, of the need to have targeted responses. Uh, there are a number of initiatives going on across government, and this is beyond women's and immigration, just because uh, the impact cut across many different, um, you know, sectors. You know, family services, um, uh, BAW services, um, healthcare, and others uh, that are beyond, you know, our mandate. Uh, so it is, you know, more of a cross-government um, uh, uh, type of issue that's being looked at. Um, uh, careful attention is being um, uh, paid, I would say, uh, to how to respond and take into account uh, the disproportionate impact and, and intersection of factors such as ability, race, uh, gender, um, uh, that uh, those factors play in um, in terms of program design, uh, embedding that lens in how uh, we fund, in how we design programs, but also in um, in targeting uh, programs and services and funding uh, to meet very specific needs. Uh, there is quite a bit of work. I can I can't really provide specifics. Uh, there's also a budget about to be released in just uh, another ten days or so. And uh, actually, no, less than 10 days, the 5th of November. And uh, so some of that will, I think, be, become clear over the coming um, uh, weeks uh, and months in terms of what are some of those targeted responses. Uh, but those will come from various departments. It, they will not just be, uh, you know, 
from immigration or from women's issues because the issues really cut across uh, different program areas and, uh, and different departments. So I, I, I think what, what we will do is we'll be watching uh, the intersectionality of um, uh, not only of client, client um, uh, of client needs, and, uh, but also of uh, services uh, that support the same client essentially. Laura? You will notice this is my question that I sent you around equity and funding, right? So, it's very, yeah, forward. very, very similar, similar. actually. Yeah. Um, and so I think, um, so I think there, there are a number of different ways that we could also address this question. The, the visible minority uh, women employment uh, pilot, I think, is, um, is a really good starting point for us at IRCC. And, and we're really looking forward to seeing the results of that project, of that pilot. Um, and where we can look at the success factors to be able to begin to implement that more specifically into our regular programming um, and see that continue. And so I think that that's probably one of our starting points. But um, we've been we've been focused um, we've been very focused on um, on looking at uh, opportunities to address um, racism and looking at um, our own programming in the department. Of late, um, the deputies have come out very strongly on, on anti-racism, and there are high expectations in the department that we will be looking at this very closely. I know that Fraser's also talked to the NSIC about taking on um, taking on anti-racism in in the uh, in the sector, and how and that we want to work very closely with uh, with the umbrellas uh, as well as all of our partners in the NSIC uh, to be able to develop um, an approach and and programming that would work. And so I think there's a lot more to come on this issue. Um, we've looked at, I think that the way that we currently do our funding is, is um, and it's, it's, more, it's more about equality than equity, I think. And so we have, a, um, we have a funding allocation formula and that's distributed across the country. It's based on landings. It's you know, very, very refined and, and uh, in a very rigorous process. Um, but I think we also need to look more closely at what the needs are um, in various communities and specifically uh, for women and specifically for, uh, for people of color. And, and I think that's a real opportunity for us to work closely with the sector going forward to find ways that we can address, uh, address that better and, and find those opportunities um, to do better. And, and we really do look forward to working with the sector on that. Very good. Um, as you can imagine, and I, and I have a question around um, data, disaggregated data that I'll come back to in a minute. Mm. But Laura, uh, uh, just a technical question. The sector is very worried about what happens um, for post-March 2021 because of landing numbers. Um, mm. is there, so the question keeps coming up. Are, is the department committed to the negotiated amounts of funds um, that organizations have done in their five years DAs? Uh, so no, that's a it's a question that we've been wrestling with as well, and um, the uh, the minister will be announcing the new levels plan at the end of this week, and so um, kind of I can't really um, speak to that point until we have the the new levels plan established. Um, but I think there there are huge considerations for us as well. I mean we were. We were very deliberate this year uh, during COVID in, in not reducing funding or not, not penalizing organizations that were unable to deliver their full programming. And it was important to us to retain the talent that we have in and experience that we have in our in these organizations to continue to deliver these services. I think it was very challenging, um, even with the, the, the model that we have, where you have kind of ebbs and flows and increases and decreases and landings, is that can have a big impact in especially in certain regions um, on the level of funding that they're receiving and, and it's challenging to be able to manage through that so um, you can rest assured that we are looking at this very closely that we will be taking those uh, kind of the, your concerns into consideration um, and our goal is really to ensure the continuity of a high quality service delivery and so you know we'll be doing uh, what we can to make sure that we're able to balance um, that objective with with the funding levels that come forward. Um, I would I think, be positive on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We won't take it as a commitment, but we're taking it as a direction <laughs> that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the pandemic has really uh, surfaced for us um, just the deep inequalities. Um, you, you, all three of you have, have talked about it. Um, 
one one of our frustrations have been the, the the federal and provincial governments being unable to tell us, for example, um, who are the organizations they're funding based on gender. So, for example, with IRCC and the province, um, Yvonne, um, we've been asking for uh, data based on women's organizations, right? Who are the women's organizations that you're funding? And Jamais for, for, for Wage, we're wanting to know who are the racialized, um, Black-led, racialized-led, racialized-mandated organizations that you're funding? Because we want to be able to ensure that the communities that have been most impacted, the communities that um, pre-pandemic and particularly now um, during this pandemic are the are, that their organizations are being supported to provide the kinds of supports that those communities need. Yvonne, you talked about um, anticipating an increase in services, absolutely. Um, everything from employment services to gender-based violence supports. Um, what's the thinking happening in terms of um, disaggregated data collection um, based on gender, based on race, based on disability in terms of who, we, who it is that you're funding, right? You're able, for example, IRC and I think um, all three of you are able to tell us um, how many francophone organizations you're funding. Mm -hmm. How can you tell us, um, or is there any thinking about um, being able to break down or collect data based on women's led and women focused organizations, most, more, more for us women's focused organizations, um, black and racialized led and focused organizations? Um, any conversation happening around that? What are some of the the thinking that you're having. Oh, I you can start, Yvonne, yeah. Yeah, I can start. Uh, so with regards to uh, the first point about who we fund, um, you know, organizations that are focused on women or immigrant women or uh, different groups, um, I, I'm happy to provide that information, but I believe it's posted on our website. And I think the list of everyone we fund uh, should be posted. Um, but I will double check because um, uh, our website is managed centrally in government. It used to be managed by each ministry. So sometimes things change, uh, but I'm happy to provide that information. I think it's, uh, sorry, Yvonne, I think it's much more so than who you fund, but if you were able to break down the data, so to say, um, out of the 97 or 98 organizations we fund, X percentage are going to women's mandated yeah. organizations, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so we, we we do know that um, uh, uh, um, in many cases, like I'm looking, I'm thinking about um, our newcomer settlement program specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, they are a number of, you know, women focused and women, uh, women's led organizations. Uh, there are also some uh, women's focused organizations that also serve, you know, uh, men and others. And, uh, you know, may have a focus on children, families, like they may have, you know, different streams of services. Uh, but that information is available. Um, so with, so I just want to address uh, the second part of your comments, which is about race-based uh, data collection. So, you know, one thing is to know, um, uh, you know, what you're funding, who you're funding. A different thing is to know uh, who is being impacted by those services and, um, and, and to try to link that to outcomes, right? Um, so there is, I can tell you that there has been uh, a, quite a bit of work going on in the last few months. Um, it's been going on for a few years now, but I would say that maybe there is a new momentum now um, uh, to collect race-based data. Uh, in immigration, for example, for uh, newcomer settlement programs, we collect um, information such as um, country of origin, language, you know, language of clients or top languages. Uh, but not um, race-based data, and, uh, and country of origin is not a good proxy for race um, always. Uh, so uh, we are looking precisely at that. Um, it, I, it's actually something that is being looked at across government. Um, even within government, um, uh, there is uh, being uh, significant attention to um, uh, our workforce within the government, looking at the demographic composition uh, of the workforce and collecting um, uh, demographic information. Uh, each employee is able to now enter that type of immigrant immigration into our information system. Uh, so the government has a picture of, uh, you know, not only of the makeup of the workforce, but looking at the makeup of the workforce uh, for different um, types of jobs at, you know, the highest and lowest um, uh, levels. Uh, so that work is actually very much active right now. And I expect that um, 
that uh, there will be uh, changes in how data is collected. Um, the anti-racism uh, directorate within the Ontario government uh, released its uh, latest annual report um, and it does, um, there has been uh, some work uh, that's more advanced in terms of a collection of data, race-based data uh, in um, uh, child welfare, uh, in um, corrections, um, and you know, the intent is to over, the, you know, over time uh, look at other uh, key uh, sectors uh, where that should be happening. Um, uh, the, um, Another um, uh, stream of work that's happening uh, within the provincial government is uh, related to transfer payments modernization, um, which um, to some degree that um, relates to um, moving many, many programs across uh, the uh, provincial government uh, to uh, the transfer payment Ontario, TP Ontario platform, uh, which we already use in our programs, but going beyond transitioning organizations to using the database, um, going beyond to optimizing um, uh, data collection digitally. Uh, so a lot of the reporting, whether it's a qualitative or quantitative, uh, to have that done directly online, and, and then to be able to collect um, uh, in some instances where possible, where privacy uh, uh, allows for that um, data related to clients that, you know, that touch on race and, and, and gender and other um, uh, aspects um, of uh, clients' lives. So there is quite a bit going on. Uh, so I expect that over the coming um, year or and more and beyond, uh, we will see changes to um, an, an, an increased access and, and, and a, you know, a picture of um, who's being served and how, and uh, I'm beginning to look to link that to funding as well. Um, Germain or Laura, Laura? Sure, I, I can jump in. I th my response will be actually very, very similar to Yvonne's, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, we're collaborating closely on, on many of these aspects. But um, with respect to um, looking at the race-based data for organizations and, and for, for women-led organizations, I think part of our challenge, especially when it comes to the executive director, is that we don't necessarily collect that information um, up front. I mean, we can we can do the searches and we can go through the the databases that we have to pull that information out. Yeah, and um, sorry, sorry, Laura. We're still yeah, yes, and because eighty percent of the sector is uh, headed up by women, we're much. Oh, sorry. More interested in like women mandated organizations. Some sorry, you cut out there for a second. I, I on women, that. on on women mandated as opposed to women led. Given that eighty percent of our sector is women led, yeah. Yeah, and again, then we can we can often tell through the description and the mandate of the organization. Um, but to your point, it, it's not something that we've actually kind of categorized on and uh, and collected on a in a in a kind of more concerted fashion to be able to report back on it. Um, what I will say though, which is very similar to to uh, Yvonne's response, is that we're definitely looking at uh, how we can do more in this area, um, and in, in particular on the uh, outcomes data. Um, data collection with respect to the clients that are being served. I know there's work going on there uh, with respect to how we can uh, provide more race-based data um, to help to identify um, areas that require with more needs and whether we're, we're meeting the needs of clients um, in those in those particular areas. Um, and we also have the the the, um, the annual survey that goes out uh, that helps to collect information on both client and non-client data. Um, and adding some more um, functionality to that survey to help to help provide more information with respect to to the uh, the makeup of our clients. Um, I think overall uh, the changes that are happening will will help us do more in this area. And there's there's still a lot of conversations going on. We have the new outcomes or the first annual outcomes report for the settlement sector uh, at IRCC will be released um, this fiscal year. Um, and so I think we'll be building on that report to continue to, to add in these important factors to ensure that we are funding, uh, that the funding kind of follows uh, the needs uh, of our clients and organizations and that we can, can do better in, the, in this particular area. But I, I think for, to your point, Debbie, though, there's still a lot for us to do here. And again, uh, um, we, we would be reaching out to the sector to get more information on what would be most helpful. Thank you, Germain. In terms of race-based data collection? 
I, I think with uh, the issue of diversity and, and inclusion is that is more prominent in these days, these, these days in, in, in every department. Mm -hmm. uh, it's even more important today to do that work. Uh, unfortunately, um, similar to my colleagues, we, these are not the data that we had in the past, we were collecting in the past. And um, prior to uh, our capacity building program, that was that were funded. The projects that were funded last year, there was really a very very low amount of uh, um, risk led and 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 focus or women's organization that were being funded. But um, I know that there's more and more questions that we need to respond to in terms of the numbers. Uh, so I know going going forward, we will be uh, collecting the data and we will be able to to you know openly and honestly say this is these are the numbers of uh, of um you know race-led organization women's organization that we're funding but again as i mentioned um for the for example for the um human trafficking call that we recently closed uh there was a test in there about uh, we're asking organization to take on that gba plus uh, uh, training that we have online, and there was a question in the in the application form where we actually asked them to to show us how they intend to uh, to add that intersectionality lens. And some of those qu the question was actually important in the assessment of the um, of the of the of the proposals that we received. And if any, an organization did not adequately provide an answer on how to include how to make sure that there is an inclusion of more than just one. You know, one particular group of uh, of of the population. You know, they were receiving either less points or or or, or they were you know they were taken out of the um, the assessment process. So we're trying to include that GBA plus lens in the processes more and more. And uh, I I can't give you a number right now, but I'm sure that I can I can maybe you know share something in the future with you. That would be great. Um, we have so many questions and only like five minutes left and I don't know where to go. Um, so two questions, um, because I, I, I do want to talk about smart funding um, as the last question. Um, but for IRCC and NSP, um, addressing issues of pay equity. Um, and so I'm assuming people are thinking either they're not being funded by wage or they're assuming wage um, pays attention to issues of pay equity. Um, but it's directed to this question is directed to um, Yvonne and Laura, um, what's the thinking happening around pay equity to address the inequality of compensation in the sector? Um, you know that Ocasi and CSAC say undertook a national survey last year. Um, clear, um, they, clear findings that women um, in leadership positions and especially racialized people in leadership positions um, are making far less, the, 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 there, there's a real um, gap between um, the way white leadership in the sector is funded and women and racialized leadership is funded. Um, I know that Yvonne, the province has a pay equity um, regime um, that many organizations benefit from. There has been a call to increase that. Um, for example, at Ocasi, the pay equity amount have not increased in 25 years. <laughs> um, so what's the thinking and for IRCC, have you given any thought to implementing a pay equity um, regime to compensate um, particularly women um, workers uh, given, given this, this, the disparity in, pay, in, in, in compensation in the sector? Um, Laura, we'll start with you. You're muted. <laughs> I owe a dollar to GCWCC. It's a, yes, you do. <laughs> Fraser's the champion, and that that's the the one of the the approaches to freezing funds. All right, you, you, I'm now I'm now recorded that I owe a dollar. Um, so sorry about that. The, on the, the so the the pay equity question. It's a really interesting question, and I think um, since I've I've joined the organization, this has come up on our various meetings, and I think the report that was done by uh, CISO Axe and Okazi um, has a lot of really good information in it. I think the the issue for us has always been that we're the funder, we're not the employer, and so um, the um, I think the the work that we can do uh, through CISA Axe and Okazi is to look at kind of the um, how to encourage uh, organizations and boards uh, of these organizations to look at this seriously and to take this into consideration when they're developing their pay scales within each organization. Um, but it's very difficult for us to be dictating that from, from a, the funder's perspective. And so I think um, we, we are happy to continue to work with you on that. Um, but I think as far as um, 
uh, exploring more of a pay equity um, approach uh, to our funding, it, it just becomes very um, challenging because uh, we don't want to cross that line. Um, we have uh, incorporated um, some incremental um, an incremental percentage to try to address um, uh, not necessarily pay equity between um, the uh, what you're finding as far as gaps in in, in remuneration uh, within the sector, but we are trying to include um, an additional um, uh, increment when we do the levels calculations to account for kind of almost like an inflation rate, and so that helps us to ensure that we're we've, we've included some um, consideration um, to ensure that the as um, funding levels um, are allocated that we've we've kind of maintained the allocation around salaries um, but it doesn't it doesn't get at a pay equity question uh, the way that you've asked it here so we, we would continue to work with you in your in, in CISA XA as far as um, how we can support, but I, I don't think we're in a position that we can impose. Thank you. Yvonne, any plans to increase pay equity in Ontario? Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, <laughs> so uh, so the, the short answer is, I don't know. Um, the reason is that um, and pay equity is for those of you who may, um, you know, may, may remember this, Pay, pay equity is a historical program based on pay rates that would have been set more than 30 years ago. And, uh, and it was um, uh, in the context of supporting pay equity legislation. Um, so it's a very prescribed uh, program. It's not something that is determined you know, by ministries or, or programs even. Um, uh, I do know that, um, and, and it's, uh, th there is a pay equity commission uh, that reports through the Ministry of Labor, or historically has reported through the Ministry of Labor. And uh, so now, uh, just to answer your question, uh, so like, uh, similar to what Laura said is, um, you know, the employer, we're now employers, you know, the, or the organizations that we fund are the employers and set the rates. So um, if there are inequities, it's not, you know, it's obviously something that needs to be addressed by organizations themselves. But that takes, takes us to the other point that you made earlier about smart or good funding, right? Um, obviously, it's easy to say, you know, you're the employer, you know, you need to set your rates and figure it out, um, uh, which is probably the official answer um, from a kind of legal perspective. Um, but it's difficult to do um, uh, without good funding. And, uh, or, uh, and um, especially you mentioned leadership, you know, inequities at the leadership level. Leadership positions are often funded by multiple sources sometimes. Um, uh, like I know, for example, in our own newcomer settlement program, most our funding typically goes through frontline services. Um, so there, it's, it's a complex issue. Um, but I would say that this goes back to um, uh, um, organizational decisions, uh, access to good funding as opposed to just funding. Um, uh, sometimes uh, we have seen uh, a tendency to um, scatter a lot of funding to many different players uh, on the positive side uh, that allows uh, us to expand our pool of funding recipients to allow new and emerging organizations to uh, receive some funding. But that also means that unless you have an infusion of new funding, it also means that the funding amounts are um, stretched um, uh, to the point where uh, it's difficult to effectively fund or to even fully fund in many cases a service. Um, so I, I would say that uh, it's very important for organizations to, um, uh, in funding requests, um, uh, whenever there is a process to open up programs, uh, to truly reflect their true costs, um, to include that and make the case if they see inequities, because uh, that, that helps us to um, make that case as well. Um, but uh, happy to actually be happy to continue to have this conversation. As Absolutely. Well. You know, it, I mean, there is this challenge between uh, equity in funding and, you know, distribution and access to funding uh, to a finite pool of resources and, and, and funding. Yeah. 
and um, versus um, good funding and smart funding, um, which is, you know, to some degree may require uh, that you step back and, um, and restrict uh, how much you do to be able to do what you do better or more of it. And uh, so that, you know, it is a, a challenge, but we would be happy to engage with you to better understand and unpack actually some of the findings of uh, the work you've done um, nationally. Oh, absolutely. And and want, we want, we absolutely want to continue this conversation with all of the funders of our sector, um, and because I think we need to do some education around frontline funding officers as well, that oftentimes organizations get to a place where they're needing to make reform to pay attention um, to make up for lagging compensation. And so there may be significant increases and funding officers have to be comfortable with that. Um, folks, thank you for staying on. I've asked for an extra five minutes because I really do want to hear from our presenters today. Um, our last question, what is what does smart funding look like? We keep hearing that it isn't good enough to just throw small amounts of money after systemic issues. When you think about smart funding, what is smart funding? You each have like 90 seconds. Um, Jomen, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> I don't know what smart funding is. Well, <laughs> I think, I think it's, well, what what I answered as as uh, as for me, what smart funding is is actually looking at that GBA plus thing, and um, making sure that uh, because if I look at the program, my funding program, the funding program funding that um, uh, Wage has, um, we fund organizations to 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 work at the systemic level, and we do understand that working at the systemic level means you need to have you know. Um, sufficient like adequate funding to be able to to work at that level but you also need to have the right people at the table who will be able to uh, move the dial move that uh, needle to the next level so for me it's just, uh, uh, so s smart funding is is applying G uh, your gba lens on it Laura. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. I love this question, actually. It made, it, it made me think a lot. And I, I checked in with a few people and I looked it up online. Um, but for, I think from, for, for IRCC, like smart funding would be like targeted funding. And so um, we've got the, you know, the Visible Minority Newcomer Women pilot, um, which has helped us to really focus in our funding on a specific issue that was raised by the sector and try to find the best approaches to meet the needs of, of this target group. And so I think that that's one way to, to kind of be really smart about the funding and, and, and it, as a pilot, we're hoping that that would then um, provide us with insights and lessons learned that we could then carry forward into more of our core funding, core program funding areas. But another example I think would be um, on smart investments. And so uh, COVID has offered us a really interesting opportunity in many ways and has forced us uh, to focus on our technology, um, both our, our our ability to use it and our, and in some cases, our lack of uh, ability or lack of technology. And so this shift to remote work and to online services um, has been really helpful in focusing our attention on that. Um, and we've, we're also, um, I think you're aware, we're launching um, a technology working group that's going to help us look at um, the best uh, types of technology, the best use of technology, uh, looking at hybrid models as well. And so out of this, this experience, I think we'll be able to provide um, some really good guidance um, to help focus in on smart investments that would allow for kind of platform development or platform investments that would um, even, you know, dare I say, allow for interoperability of systems to really um, have a good impact. And when we're thinking about, um, you know, platforms that we're using for language, you know, I think there's language training and, and different, um, different investments. I think there's a real opportunity here um, for us to be smart about how, how we build that technology into our programming for the future and, and how we look at funding it. So I'll stop very, there. Very good. <laughs> Yvonne. <laughs> um, so well, if this kind of is a little bit connected to the conversation we just had about good funding and, yes. and you know, fully funding um, the cost of service delivery. Uh, but beyond that, you know, there are other elements that come to mind. Uh, for example, um, uh, you know, a lot of funding 
uh, it tends to be historically based uh, in part because it's multi-year, because obviously um, you can't just ship things from year to year to year and destabilize um, organizations or a sector. Um, but I think uh, there, there needs, we need to have the ability to, um, uh, you know, better balance that kind of um, uh, predictability, historical patterns, et cetera, of funding uh, with uh, the ability to uh, respond to new and emerging needs to be bold as well, to, you know, kind of figure out it is like, what can we do that is really, really, you know, uh, a great thing. And how do we enable some of those things to occur, learn from it, figure out what to scale up. I mean, that comes to mind. Something else that, else that comes to mind is um, being able to tie funding to outcomes, um, uh, you know, like and, and results mm -hmm. uh, in a more effective way, and uh, uh, you know, just a better connection between uh, investments and um, and actual client outcomes. I think that would be. I mean, it's it's, it's not easy to get there, but I think uh, that's another element of um, uh, smart funding. I'll leave it there. Very good. Lots of lots of food for thought for us to think through. I love the idea of um, funding being outcomes based and um, global funding, so organizations are able to be responsive. Um, lo love the discussion around technology, around um, GBA plus um, framing ar around funding. Thank you to all three of you, Laura De Paolo, Shomen Shazu Izindi, and Yvonne Ferrer. It is such a good conversation and there's so much more for us to talk about. I know I can hear my colleague, um, Elena Chaprasnikova saying, you didn't mention OCMS and get a commitment for them to fund organizations to be able to, to subscribe. So it's there, Elena, I've said it and they all smiled at me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience. This is our last day of the conference, hoping to see you all this afternoon at our plenary session and especially at 3 p.m. at our annual general meeting. Thank you all three. This has been a fantastic conversation. Very glad that we were able to have it and that I was able to be your moderator this morning. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Same Thank to you, you, Debbie. Bye. Thank you.